When somebody learns of who Jesus is and what he did, for crying out loud, you're called to the ministry. Hello, and welcome to Crosstalk. My name is Elijah Weiss. I know you're probably used to seeing my grandfather or my dad on screen, but today we have something special. Crosstalk is celebrating 50 years of ministry. 50 years, that's more than double my lifetime. Now don't get me wrong, Crosstalk has only been a TV series for about half of those 50 years. Nevertheless, this milestone has really made me think. This ministry has been around much longer than me, and it has progressed through many different mediums throughout the years. I've heard stories, I've seen things progress since I was a kid, but now, being an editor and producer for Crosstalk TV and being more hands-on than I have ever been, I've begun to realize Crosstalk is so much more than what I've understood it to be. And it's really made me think and question, what is the legacy of Crosstalk? So I thought, why not investigate that and take you along with me? This series of episodes will answer the question, what is the legacy of Crosstalk? We're gonna take a deep dive into how the ministry started and what it has looked like throughout the years and where we are today. To begin this series, I wanna start at the beginning with the man himself, my grandfather, Dr. Randy Weiss. We're gonna start with him telling us about his salvation story because for him, that's where it all began. Stick with us through this series. I promise you will enjoy it. I know I did. I wanted to start off, you know, of course, I've heard the stories from you and from Grammy, and we're celebrating 50 years of ministry and 50 years of your marriage. And in 50 years, a lot has happened. And I've only heard a fraction of what has happened. So I wanted to, to ask you from the beginning, how did this whole idea of being a minister of the gospel, how did this start with you specifically? And how did God place that into your heart? Well, you know, you hear stories of people, you know, God called them. And uh, sometimes I think it was uh, daddy called, mommy sent. Uh, uh, maybe mommy called and daddy sent. Uh, I don't want to oversimplify it, but neither do I want to overcomplicate it. <laughs> I didn't know anything about Jesus. I, I grew up not knowing anything about Jesus Christ, except other people, not my people, other people, you know, liked him, loved him. I don't know if they worshiped him. I don't know what they did. I know that they named churches after him and, and uh, they had all these saints and uh, in, in the community where I grew up, there were a lot of Catholic churches, and I'm sure there were a lot of Protestant churches, but I, you know, I just really didn't have any connection. I had connection with my friends who, my non-Jewish friends, in theory, were Christians, but I can't say I really know that because they never really talked about Jesus. And, you know, I don't recall people telling me you're going to, you're a sinner and you're going to die and go to hell unless you believe in Jesus. And I mean, it, it was as, as a Jewish kid, they, people just didn't talk to us about Jesus and it wasn't something discussed at home. And so it was foreign. Now, that probably seems kind of bizarre. Like, how can you grow up in America and not know about Jesus? But it was easy. <laughs> so why am I saying that? You asked me the question, like, how did you get called into ministry? And I said I didn't want to oversimplify it, and neither did I want to overcomplicate it. When somebody learns of who Jesus is and what he did, for crying out loud, you're called to the ministry. <laughs> I mean, so, so, yeah, that's how it happened. I learned about Jesus and he changed my life. And if, if your life has been touched by Jesus and you're not telling everybody about him, 
you need to look in the mirror and ask yourself the question, was it just indigestion or did you have an experience with God? Because if you've had an experience with God, you're in the ministry. Now, you may not be being paid in the ministry. It may not be a gig that, you know, that I've been in the ministry for over 50 years. There's other ways to make a living. And I don't feel God called me to be a professional in, as a minister. He called me to tell everybody about Jesus. And I have been doing that for over 50 years. Now, it probably looks like, because we do operate what is by any definition an international ministry, and we have been for many decades, <laughs> but it's not a gig. It's a call, and it's the same call that I think everybody has. I think anybody that has had an experience with God is called to be a minister of the gospel, however you make a living. Yeah, that's encouraging to me, of course, because I, I agree with you in being a minister of the gospel in my sense, but I think you're right, and I think a lot of people neglect the fact that as a follower of Christ, we are called to preach the gospel. Um, so that's simply put, but not over simplifying it. Well, I mean, there's two aspects to it that that I feel personally obligated to be involved in, to announce the love of God and the coming of Messiah, you know, a declarative role and a discipleship role. We're called to make disciples. We don't get people saved. You know, I, I don't think we have that capability. Now, people do come to faith as a result of the ministry that we do, but that's if we're faithful to declare the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is and what he did, so that people like me don't grow up and not know anything about him and have the opportunity to learn about him early in life so that they don't make some of the mistakes that so many of us who fail to know Jesus make. Uh, so it's, it's declarative to announce the love of God and the coming of Messiah, to preach the gospel. And it is God who does all the saving, okay? It's this, this, one of the job descriptions of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. One of his job descriptions is to convict a sinner of their sin. Until I knew I was a sinner, what, what, why would I have needed Jesus? What was, I didn't need to know about him because I didn't need a savior until I knew I was a sinner. It was the Holy Spirit that convicted me of my sins and then I was sensitive to the need for salvation. I was desperate from that moment when I learned I was a sinner. Really, my heart was gripped by my own, con my sinful condition that I was guilty before God. It was the Holy Spirit that convicted me. And it's only the Holy Spirit that is any good at convicting a sinner of their sin. There's lots of people who can go around and judge people and make them feel bad and act badly towards them. I don't know that that is the most effective way to draw people to Christ. And I'm not going to speak against those who minister differently than I do, okay? I know in I only know what happened in my life. The Spirit of God convicted me of my sins. When I learned I was a sinner, I needed salvation. I wanted Christ. And Christ met me where I was and saved me where I was. And then he made it clear from that moment forward, there's no turning back. There's no looking back over your shoulder like, what about, what about my, my goals, my dreams, my aspirations, my activities, my, my, the things I liked? 
you're, you, you then have to kind of grow out of who you were so that you can be that new creature that you've been born again to be. That born again creature is called to announce the love of God and the coming of Messiah, to learn the gospel, to share the gospel. And that's one phase. The other phase of our call, we're called to make disciples. I don't think we do that on our own either. That's also a work of God, but it's part of our ministry and for 50 years. Whatever, we've, whatever I've been able to learn about the goodness of God, the reality of God, the love of God, the coming of Messiah, what the scriptures declare of God and what the scriptures declare of man, whatever I've been able to learn along the way, I've tried to put into some form that I could share with other people, whether it was in the spoken word, the written word, the audio recordings, the video recordings, put it into songs, put it into sermons, or stand on a street corner, whatever. And different people, I guess, are called to function in different ways, but I think we're supposed to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And do so unashamedly. If there's a hallmark of our ministry, it's we have just been totally dependent on God. And He's helped us. He's shown us steps to take. And they haven't always made sense. They haven't always been something we really were capable of. But that didn't bother God that we didn't have certain abilities or resources or whatever it was. If God shows you to do something, and it's usually just one step, you take that step and leave it in God's hands. You're not going to save anybody. I'm not going to save anybody. If he wants somebody saved, yeah, it's his gig. <laughs> yeah. Um, for, for you specifically, whenever... Um, Whenever you were called, which, of course, like you said, whenever you figured out the love of Jesus and you discovered the calling you had on your life, what did it look like for you early days of ministry-wise? Like, bring me back to the beginning. What were you doing? Well, as I was... <laughs> I was reading a book, and it had this information about Jesus and the coming of the Lord, you know, and chaos in the world and so forth. As I was reading this book, I was so astounded. It's like, oh my, this is really, this is, and so the only person that was around at that time was your grandmother. We were on our honeymoon and I started telling her everything that I was learning. And she was like, it, it kind of was like old news to her because she had grown up in a Catholic family and went to Catholic school and Catholic church. So she had heard about Jesus. So it just wasn't, it, there was no bullets in there. <laughs> you know, she, this wasn't news to her. However, um, it wasn't his lordship had, she had not received his lordship. She, like so many people in society. I think most people have probably heard about Jesus in America, know something about him, have been to church or had family that in one form or another were connected to Christianity. That was her experience. But I didn't see her as a Christian because she, she had never told me anything about Jesus. And so I just sort of assumed had she known, she would have told me. <laughs> and uh, so my first experience was uh, as an evangelist, um, was uh, quite disappointing. <laughs> and uh, then my next experience was we were staying at one of my friend's homes, a Jewish friend. He came home from work and I began telling him about Jesus. And uh, 
both of them, uh, my, my friend and your grandmother, um, they were both convinced that I was just on a bad drug trip and that I'd come down and things would get back to my normal, abnormal self. But in, I never did. I was born again. I didn't understand. There was so much I didn't understand. And there's still, there's still much I don't understand. By the way, I've been in ministry 50 years. That's just what people say. I've been learning for 50 years. From the moment I came to know Jesus, I've just wanted to learn about him and about the scriptures and how to live for God, how to walk in faith, how to teach my family to have the same desire. Um, so uh, people look at me and they would then say, oh, well, you're in the ministry because you, you do all this ministry work and you spend all your time as much as you can just studying the Bible and telling people about Jesus. It's all part of learning, getting to know God and just getting to know God better and better and closer and closer. And there's a battle because the world is always, there's always some shiny object out there trying to get our attention. And I'm no different than anybody else. Uh, but I'm committed to this goal of as long as I live, I just want to draw nearer to the Lord and to know him better and to do what he shows to do, what he says in scripture and what the spirit of God directs us to do. So they call that ministry. <laughs> I just think it's living in faith and knowing Jesus because I think that's what we're supposed to do. Have I told you the story about the tent out in the desert? No. Okay. So Grammy and I were on a combination honeymoon record promotion tour. And we were on our way into Phoenix to go visit my Jewish friend. And we'd been sleeping in a tent. You know, we had a little pup tent and two person tent. And that's what we were living in on this glorious honeymoon and going to visit musicians and radio stations, kind of promoting the record. And as we're coming into Phoenix, and I'm driving my little 1964 Volkswagen painted up bug, I'm going 70 miles an hour. That was the max speed that thing could go with the wind at your back. And uh, I looked out in the desert and I saw this big tent. It was huge and it had a big sign on it and it said Christ is the answer and in like this millisecond I'm just driving down the road I see that Christ is the answer hmm what's the question and I just kept on driving so that, that's bizarre it was just bizarre so then I get to my friend's house he was he had to go to work I read this book I got saved I said the prayer I'm telling Adrian I'm telling my friend and then it dawns on me, oh, it's that tent. Christ is the answer. I'm supposed to go there. And I told them, we're, we're going to the tent. And they're like, huh? I said, oh, no, 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 we got to go. We got to go out to that tent. They said, what tent? The tent out in the desert, it said, Christ is the answer. They said, we're not going to that tent. I said, yes, we've got to go to that tent. I said, come on, let's go. So, you know, okay, I'll go if you go. Okay, if you go, I'll go. The two of them climbed in the Volkswagen with me and we drove out to the desert to this tent. And I got there and as we walked in, there's all these hippies. It's just Jesus freaks everywhere. And it was like, oh, this is my tribe. <laughs> and they handed me a little newspaper when I walked in. And in, on the top of the newspaper, it said, ye shall dwell in tents. And it was a text from Jeremiah. I had no idea what it was about. And uh, as a Bible college uh, student, you know the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Well, buddy, this was some eisegesis. <laughs> but like, it said, ye shall dwell in tents. 
And then it talked about the ministry. But again, I knew nothing. So, oh, they're playing all this great Jesus music and everybody's grooving and it's wonderful and, and everybody looked like me with long hair and a long beard. And I, I couldn't believe it. It was like, I'm home. These are my people. And uh, so at the end of the, uh, sur they had a service and I didn't know what's supposed to happen, but I just could intuitively recognize that they got to this point in time when it's done and that's when you go up there. I didn't know why you go up there, but people were going up there and I, I, so I nudged Adrian. I said, come on. And she said, come on where? I said, come on, we got to go up there. She said, I'm not going up there. I said, yeah, I think this is where you're supposed to go up there now and talk to the guy. There was a head guy. He was a minister. <laughs> she said, I'm not going up there. And it was like, oh, this is bad. How can you not go up there? And she was like, no, there was, I mean, and so I, I said to Julian, I said, come on, Julian, we got to go up there. I said, come on, we got to go. They said, they're not going. And I knew right then, I'm going. I'm, I'm going. That's what I'm supposed to do. And uh, there was no turning back in my mind from the prayer I had said when I read that book. And I knew this was the next step. I didn't know what it was. I had the newspaper and it said, ye shall dwell in him. So I went up to the front and the guy was there and there was a lot of people up there. They were praying and doing whatever they do. And the guy, I waited till I could talk to him and I said, hey, um, I'm coming with you. And he looked at me, he was an older guy, you know, he could have been 30, I don't know. He, uh, he, he looked at me and he said, Okay. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm coming with you. And he said, well, what? That's... he was puzzled, you know? And I said, uh, but my wife's not. And he's like, huh? Are you married? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm married. We're on our honeymoon. She's over there. He said, well, w w what do you mean you're coming with me and she's not I said well I read the it said you shall dwell in tents so I'm coming with you he said son you, you have to dwell with your wife I said well yeah but she's not going to live in the tent and I'm coming with you and he said son you, you have to dwell with your wife. Have you read the Bible? I said, no, I read the late great planet Earth. And he said, son, you can't come with us. You got to stay with your wife. And he gave me a Bible. A minister of the gospel isn't supposed to leave their wife, okay? <laughs> Check, okay, let me write that down. Yeah, write that down. <laughs> but a minister of the gospel should understand the concept of no turning back. So I was perplexed. I was confused. He was confused. <laughs> he had no idea what was Sir going Grammy on. Grammy was confused. <laughs> Grammy was terribly confused. Uh, but, you know, when I said the prayer in the back of that book, I knew what it would mean. I knew that meant that that was the end of my family, my parents and sisters and uncles and aunts and cousins. So I knew I was going to, it was, there was a cost to walking with Christ. Well, there often is a cost to walking with Christ, but it's certainly worth whatever the cost is to have peace with God and the assurance of salvation. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I've said before, it's encouraging to hear because it's almost unreal how much faith you had immediately and all of that 
brought us to here. Wow, I didn't know I would learn so much by simply asking a few questions. Maybe there's more to investigate than I realized. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. It's always such a blessing to be able to sit down with my grandfather and hear his stories. He carries a lot of God-given wisdom and is great at sharing it with the people he comes in contact with. I'm lucky, as his grandson, because I get to spend time with him on a regular basis. If you guys want to hear more from my grandfather, be sure to follow us on social media with the handle at Crosstalk TV. We post on all of our social media often and it gives you more opportunities to hear from my grandfather. You know, while I was listening to my grandfather's salvation story, I was fascinated by how simple he made it seem. Even though I know it was a complex decision, he read a book, a book, and it wasn't even the Bible. And through that, he made a major decision to follow Jesus. He made that decision knowing it was going to cost him his relationship with his family. He made that decision knowing it was going to drastically change his life. At the end of the day, he didn't care about what he was losing because he learned of the salvation that Jesus offers and he knew he had to have it. What I love about my grandfather's story is that once he got saved, he was all in. You heard him say a moment ago that he was called to ministry when he was saved. If you've experienced God's love, how can you not tell people about it? One thing he said that really stuck with me was when he talked about no turning back. Part of me wonders what the world would be like today if every person that got saved was as ambitious about sharing God's love as my grandfather is. I think it's important to realize that we are called to share the gospel with every nation. You know that to be true if you've heard of the Great Commission in Matthew 28. It says in verse 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That calling isn't just for pastors or people on Christian television. That calling is for all Christians. And fun fact, the people you encounter on a daily basis are part of every nation. Trust me, if my grandfather can accept Jesus as a result of reading a book, I promise you, people can get saved from you telling them about Jesus. Next episode, we're going to continue to investigate the legacy of Crosstalk. We're going to talk a little bit about how my grandfather packed up his family and smuggled Christian materials past the communist Iron Curtain in Europe for the underground church. It's a crazy story that you probably haven't heard before. If that sounds interesting to you, I encourage you, follow us on all the major social media platforms with the handle at Crosstalk TV so you won't miss it. We also post encouragement on a regular basis and you can direct message us if you have something you want to share. If you've enjoyed this episode, and would like to see more like it, you can find all of our past episodes on our YouTube, Crosstalk TV. I'm excited to continue to hear more stories and to take you along this journey over the next several episodes. Until next time, Shalom and God bless.